Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddham Dhammang Sangam Namasami I want to express my gratitude to Bhante Sudasa and Giovanni Maselli. <laughs> Is that correct? Yes. Uh, from Buddhist Insights, who invited me to come and who invite so many other monastics to come so that you can meet people who live in monasteries. And then that brings the monastery to New York instead of you having to go to the monasteries that are spread far and wide. I happen to come from Canada. And I think you met Ajahn Punadamo. He also comes from Canada. But he's about a 12 hour drive from where we are. And that's only in, that's one province. It's a lot of space in Ontario. Maybe we're, we're Ontario has an O on each end, so there's a monastery on each end. <laughs> so, we have a little monastery. It's um, it's a, a nun's monastery, and it's uh, so far the only monastery in Canada for women in this tradition, in this forest sangha, forest tradition of practice. And uh, so I'm just contemplating on this topic of fearlessness. So starting a, a monastery in a country that has uh, no tradition of women ordaining uh, within this particular line of practice um, is something that I, I never dreamed about when I became a nun, never occurred to me, never thought about coming back to Canada, I spent 40 years in uh, many other countries and avoided the cold of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and then the cold didn't seem to matter anymore. I was yearning for people that were interested in the Dharma, people interested in practice and in truth, in understanding themselves. And I came to Canada over the years um, back in 2006 for a couple of years and um, there was such a vibrant community there so I ended up accepting a third invitation to return and I was asked if I would stay longer and then finally um, one of the monks up there said why don't you just come and stay so I did but it so happened that um, in between the, first, the second invitation and the third one, I got full ordination. So they didn't actually know they were inviting a fully ordained nun, which was a little bit out of the box, because the box that I had been in was n nuns didn't get full ordination. So I wasn't sure how it would be received, and I wasn't going to say anything about it, it was just my own personal happiness to be able to carry that level of training and work with it. But um, one of my monastic colleagues said, you cannot be a closet bhikkhuni. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I reported to the community, well, by the way, um, anyway, fearlessness, yeah, I was pretty scared. It was a, f a fearful thing to do. Um, I had been trained to think in one way about this particular form, and then suddenly 
I was in the front lines. And being in the front lines means that you get a lot of flack. You must all know what that feels like. Uh, living uh, here in, in a big, very vibrant city, which probably has a lot of challenges, but it has also so many positive features. Um, you're willing to accept the challenges because of the, the good qualities that you find here. The inclusivity and the diversity and the vibrancy and the, the, just the ability to express so many different forms of being a human being all pulled together in this wonderful space. And so I, I think for me it was a similar thing like knowing the monastic life, having lived without full ordination for 20 years, um, I felt like it was something that I wanted to bring and express, even if nobody understood it. And, but the beauty of it was that quite early on we were able to move to a property with a forest on it. And so when you're close to nature, close to the trees, the coyotes, the raccoons, the bears, uh, winter, winter, summer, intense seasons, spring, fall, very intense ticks, and all those dangers, seeming dangers, but it, we're, we're the ones that are the intruders, the human beings. So to um, go every night to my uh, hut in the for near the forest um, at night in the dark, one learns to be with that sense of fear. And it's the same way with carrying a lineage or, or carrying a tradition that you know is not accepted and uh, some people will tell you to your face that you don't exist. Um, you may many of you may have experienced this in one way or another, or seen your friends experience it. It's not an easy thing to carry without um, a sense of being somehow defeated, or a sense of injustice, or a sense of um, you, you want to cry out and protest and say, that's wrong, that shouldn't be happening. But it is happening. So I found that going every night to my hut in the forest, not knowing, well, we had, I had a torch. And I chanted, I chant, you know, chant to uh, devas or the forces of blessing to protect me. And pretty soon I realized that actually nature takes care of, just like those who take care of the truth, the Dhamma, the Dhamma takes care of us. And so, by having a gentle heart and not wanting to harm any living thing, I began to feel that the creatures would not harm me. And if I chanted to them, they definitely would listen. And it so happened that after many years, um, some of the deer that have been coming close to our buildings would come closer and if I was walking, in the beginning they would run away and all you could see the white of the back of their, their tails disappearing in the bush. So I knew that they were more afraid of me than I was of them. And this helped me develop a fearlessness. But even more beautiful was, uh, in more recent years, when they would see me coming and I would be chanting, they would just look at me and their ears would wiggle a little, and then they would continue grazing. And I realized that they recognized the chant. And they, they knew that, well, we're just some kind of deer that live there. And they, they, they became, we became deer. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was such a teaching. It was uh, a way of developing a connection and a communion with that which you're part of, and which at first seems very fearsome and very unmanageable. 
But if you keep doing it every day with an attitude that I, I will overcome the fear, I will be gentle, I will care for every step, I will not walk with violence on this land, I will be in tune with the forest, I will respect the creatures, I will not kill any living being. These are uh, kind of unspoken precepts that we follow as, as monastics. Then eventually, the world around us begins to respond in an unexpected fashion. It begins to respond to that kind of rhythm. It listens, it hears it, and it reverberates with it. It, it becomes a response, it responds to that which we're developing within us, which already exists. We're actually responding to the gentleness that is around us. Because the creatures in and of themselves are also very vulnerable. Human beings, we have a hunting season. And every November, for two weeks, deer and bear and coyotes and other animals are slaughtered. And we, we listen to the gunshots. And um, there's nothing that we can do except feel compassion for those beings. And then when we see, at the end of hunting season, we see some of the animals that we knew were in danger, we see them again. We feel so much joy, oh, they survived another season. But we live in a world that's full of violence. Every day we meet some form of violence. And when you live in close proximity with other people, you're bound to feel that violence. But really the violence comes, the root of it is really within us. Yeah. Because even if there is violence around us, we don't have to be tainted by it. And if we do react to violence with violence, then what we're doing is um, we're allowing the violence within us to take over, to overwhelm our minds. And this path of practice is really a practice of bringing peace up into every moment. So even like when you were sitting and breathing, maybe your breath didn't feel peaceful. Maybe it felt tight and noxious or uh, unpalatable because of some kind of uh, encounter that you had this morning or words that you heard something nasty that's going on in your life, or memories arising, or trauma that you've experienced in your life. So it's natural for those things to appear in consciousness, and then how do we deal with them? If we want to really care for the violence within us, we need to find a skillful way to be present for those voices and to allow them to be articulated little by little in a way that they never could in the past. Suppressing them doesn't work. Uh, distracting ourselves doesn't work. Giving in to restlessness, fear, anxiety, hatred, panic, greed, or d deluding ourselves into thinking, I don't have those feelings. Those don't work. But what does work is devoting ourselves, making a commitment to being gentle, being gentle with the breath, opening to the breath moment by moment, and allowing little by little the trickle of old held anxieties, fears, trepidation, a trembling, to feel the slightest trembling and go to its root and see where, where, is, where is it? To feel it, allow it. What happens when you tremble and you just stay with it? Eventually, just like when you stay with a sound, it might start off being loud and even acrimonious. Or we may feel brittle in the face of it. But if we stay with it and breathe into it, eventually it grows still, the reverberations stop. They arise and cease. We 
we notice the, the way they come and go, come and go. And the more we concentrate on the process itself without calling it by the names we've called it, I'm scared, I hate it, you feel terror, or you feel tight. But if we stop calling it that, we just feel it as vibration, or feel it as tension, as some kind of visceral sensation, and stay with the physical feeling of it, then our name of it will disappear, our fear of it will dissipate. And we will be able to allow that, that tremor, that quaking, that explosiveness to explode, to exhaust itself. If we give it space, that's just what nature does. It begins to fade away. And what we bring to, the way we bring that forth is by observing it, by allowing it, by studying it. Not by allowing it as fear, but by going into it to examine its true nature. What is it actually? What is the, what is the absence of fear? The absence of fear is love. What is love? It's awareness. To be able to be present for the moment fully means that we're able to be so aware of it, we give it a lot of space to the point where we actually can worship the moment. We can bring up a gratitude in the mind that allows the moment to teach us where we're at. So then we're, it's, we're no longer calling it fear. But what is it that we fear the most? Love. So there's a conundrum. Wait a minute. <laughs> The absence of fear is love, and that's what we fear the most. Because we haven't been loved. We've grown up with so much fear, with so much held trauma, with so much defendedness. We're shut down, we're disconnected, and disconnected, and we continue to pick up habits that disconnect us from ourselves and each other. So this practice of making peace with the present moment and with our own conditioning and with the violence around us is really coming to understand those violent forces within us that we've unconsciously cultivated and how we can slowly, slowly teach ourselves to bring up a spacious, conscious, aware, a noble seeing Ah, this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the way of ending it. This is the, the ending of it and the way of ending it. And we have to bring so much love and so much compassion to that process that will generate more moments that keep strengthening and fortifying that loving presence. It comes with gratitude, with contentment, with secluding ourselves. The way to keep the violence from infecting us is not to end the violence out there, but it's to grow the inner strength to receive it without violence, to disarm ourselves. One of my first teachers um, was a, a being of great inner peace. And when I first met him, I thought, oh, I won't be like that. I want that peace. And when he, he actually died as a result of a gunshot wound um, from one of his disciples. And I always felt that everything about his life was a teaching to me. And his uh, ability to embody uh, lovingness and great compassion to all kinds of human beings, even the man who murdered him. When he, he was shot, he said to him, you poor man, you're going to go to jail for this. He felt compassion because this man had kids and a wife 
and he'd be in jail and they'd be hungry. But I always felt that that was a big teaching to me. And in this age of terrorism and so much insecurity and um, hatred all around us, unpredictable, death is always unpredictable, but I always thought I should, I should learn to love the terrorist that might shoot me one day, especially walking around dressed in kind of unusual fashion. Um, in some countries, um, this would not easily be tolerated. And when I first became a nun, I was ridiculed a lot. And uh, people would spit up at me and treat me rather rudely. That doesn't happen so much anymore. Occasionally it does. And I, I always try to imagine if somebody were to come into the monastery with a rifle and enter the meditation hall and point that rifle at me, what would I do? Because think back on my teacher, how he responded with great compassion. And I try to think he's, he taught me what I need to do is prepare to meet that terrorist with love and forgiveness. So uh, that's not an easy thing to do. But it's realizing that this body is not who I am. And to die with a mind that is pure and bright and forgiving is truly a gift. So I just want to offer those reflections to you and maybe if you have some uh, differing opinions and you want to share them uh, I invite you to do so. Anyone? Mary? Mary <laughs> um, so my question is about the word love. Does it have to be love, or can it be uh, goodwill, or you know, just lack of ill will? Lack of ill will, yes. I should qualify that. I was, quote, I was actually using a, a, a Christian teaching there, a more Christian language, but in the Buddhist terms it would be goodwill. And the, absence, the absence of fear is an unconditional love. It is unconditional receptivity. There's, there's no defendedness. There's a willingness, a lovingness, a, a good willingness. Goodwill is a willingness. Yeah. So I, I, I have no problem with the word love, but I know that it's, it's been cheapened by our contemporary way of using it. Mm. But thank you for clarifying that. Yes. Can we, can we ask you a question about this year of the life? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, what does it mean to be a full ordained man? Well, we mm -hmm. keep a lot of precepts. Um, uh, 311 precepts. So, uh, do any of you know about five precepts, eight precepts like that? So, we have a, a, like a web, a worldwide web. Of precepts. Our world is encompassed by this web of precepts, and it's actually a protection. It, it requires us to be very mindful and very careful. And it, what I was talking about, this walking through the forest in the darkness of night, um, takes so much care, so much mindfulness, where you put your feet, not to... Um, walk in a way that disturbs the natural surrounding, but you have a destination. You don't want to go thrashing through the forest. Um, it's a way of gently entering into the forest or gently walking through life. Uh, these precepts help to protect us from the dangers of the mind because the mind is so unreliable. We have to train it. So the precepts help to train us. And by living such a profound training, 
it means that we learn to be fearless, actually. Because the, there's so much protection that you develop from within by having a deeper and deeper level of awareness about how the mind responds to unpleasantness, to painfulness, to deprivation. Like we renounce the right, not the right, but the independence, the freedom to have certain kinds of experience, um, so many kinds of experience. And we're alms mendicants, so we, we live on the food that people give us. Imagine if you had to dress up in a sheet and shave your head and walk down the streets of New York. It should be pretty easy, really. <laughs> Probably the easiest place in the world you could do that is here. <laughs> Nobody would care very much. <laughs> right? And, but, but you might care because you want to look a certain way. And when I first became a nun and I had to go with my alms bowl out into the street, uh, I was really nervous. I was so self-conscious. You know, but I, I, I love the life, and I, this is how the Buddha dressed. And he shaved his head. And I, want, I just wanted to copy him. <laughs> you know, I thought, if I dress like the Buddha and live like the Buddha, then I'll become a little Buddha, a female Buddha. It doesn't matter about the gender. It's the mind becoming, it's, it's growing in wisdom. This is just, this is actually a protection because when you look at your clothing, you think Buddha. This is the dress the Buddha suggested for men and women, same, similar. We're just tied differently. I do the role because I can hold it together better. We don't use Velcro. We have no zippers or buttons. So you try it. It just unravels if you let go. <laughs> and we're being taught to let go all the time, but we must never let go of our robe. So the robe becomes your skin. And the skin is actually your mindfulness and your ability to stay present and to stop giving in to greed, hatred, and delusion. So it's a very intense training. And every day you wake up and you, you have, there's a certain prerogative of living the life, being fed, being looked after, being supported by a community, but then there are expectations. We have to follow our rules. We have to let go of a lot. We don't have sex, we don't have TV, we don't eat what we want, we eat what we receive. We eat in the morning, up until solar noon. In the evening we're allowed certain ingredients that keep us from experiencing uh, low blood pressure or fainting. <laughs> and you might, some of you might know we're allowed to eat dark, dark chocolate. You might wonder, come on, <laughs> give me a break here. <laughs> That's not getting off on a technicality. That's because it resembles the certain medicinal ingredients that the Buddha allowed, like sugar, cocoa, uh, oil, butter were allowed. But you can't eat a sandwich or crackers or fruit or thing like, things like that. You can't have a meal. So you end up feeling hunger. Next day you can eat as much as you get in the morning um, when there's daylight. Those kind of rules. So the freedom that we get is not the freedom to do whatever we want. We think most people think that not having rules gives you freedom. But actually, not having rules doesn't give you safety. It gives you the freedom to make a lot of mistakes. And when you spend your life renouncing in a skillful way and having the protection of these rules that are ethical, it's like railroad tracks. They keep you on the straight and narrow. They direct you towards the truth. The truth is not out there, it's in here. So it's an inward track, an inward path that purifies your mind so much that you develop your full potential. Why wouldn't you want to do that? And so by giving up certain experiences 
in the world based on sense gratification and delusion, we end up being able to free our minds from the bones of existence and from the suffering that the world brings. And every one of us here, I'm sure, is there anyone here that's never suffered? <laughs> so all the money in the bank, all the jewelry, all the power that you get does not bring ultimate happiness. It's so temporary. It's so totally fleeting. But this life of renunciation and commitment to empowering and awakening the truth within the mind brings us complete freedom from every form of human suffering. It doesn't mean that the body stops suffering, but we pull out the second arrow, which is the mental suffering. It's really our mental illness that's the inability to have pure ill will, pure goodwill, the freedom from ill will, the fullness of love within us, the fullness of compassion, the fullness of joy, and the fullness of an evenness of mind, an unperturbability, imperturbability. It's probably almost unthinkable, but we do it breath by breath, moment by moment. So it takes commitment. What else do we do? Yeah. We, um, we live far from the maddening crowd. We, you know, I've done it for a long time, so I don't really know what I'm missing. <laughs> 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 I don't feel like I'm missing anything, except um, the ability to go beyond fear, go beyond. I have, I have not gone beyond fear. I have not gone beyond anger. I have not gone beyond greed. And I'm still working on it. So that's the only thing I miss, is that ability to be without fear. But I know it's possible. And there's nothing else to work for in this world, for me. So it's just a, a different kind of uh, profession. You know, in the Christian nun's life and monk's life, there is a, the taking of profession. And that means that you're devoting yourselves to a career, a profession. You profess, this is your aim, this is where your compass is set. It's set in that direction, and you just keep doing it for life. It's just a little bit. Yes? I understand you work uh, with a lot of hospice staff and volunteers. Yes. I'm um, curious about how you teach fearlessness to the people who work with the dying. That's a very good question. Actually, many, not all, but quite a few of the people that I've worked with who are dying teach me about fearlessness. They teach me. It started, well, it didn't start with, but I, I had the honor of being present for the death of both of my parents. I, di I, I died. I did. Part of me died with them. But um, they were, it was just the courageousness and the, uh, the beauty of their letting go, the, the joy that was there. Yeah, I, I learned from that. Just bringing uh, a loving, gentle presence to someone who's dying helps them through their process. And some people die with a lot of terror, um, probably because they have remorse or regret about their life in some way. And just by comforting them and telling them that right now, they are beautiful, lovely, and loved, just as they are. It's very comforting and reassuring, and that's all they need to die well, to die peacefully. Just that one moment of being reminded that 
you're, you're great, you're okay, and you're loved. It's very important. Great compassion in the moment. I practice that on myself. Uh, otherwise, it's really hard to bring it to people that are in a lot of pain. Because you have to bear witness to their pain. And it could bring up so much aversion. Normally, we're very averse to pain. We're, we're scared of it. Scared of it. So to be able to offer fearlessness to someone else's pain is, is quite challenging. So I try to come with that. situations, we find the fire escape, we know the way out, we, we can do it, but with the small things we fall apart. But the small things are very telling because we tend to gloss over them and they hold, it, they hold for us a secret which is that work with these little breaths one breath at a time, work with the small things and go to their depth and see where is the origin of the, the rage. Where is it really? So what I've been discovering is that the invalidation actually comes from within. Just like the terror, it comes from within. It's my own sense of fear that I'm hated, that I'm not loved. And I think uh, I discovered that fear within my body and it, it has, uh, you know, there's trauma there. I think just being born as a human being, all of us, uh, childbirth, giving birth to a child or being a child, all of us were children that were born. And some of us came out screaming, protesting, no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> terrified. And, um, you know, if your parents try to abort you, even worse. Or if you're coming into a hateful situation, you know, like illegitimate birth, or not loved by your parents, not parented well, not received well, not given love, not, not rejoiced over, then we're going to wobble. We're going to be trembling through life. We're not, we've not been validated from a tiny tot. So how can we possibly feel a sense of the ability to validate this beingness? But through the practice of mindfulness, we can discover the through the studying the interstices of our physical and mental connection, connectedness. We can go down into the roots of that trembling and re-experience it as an adult and bring a sense of jo rejoicing and joy about it. That this human birth is a wonderful gift, a wonderful opportunity, and we have a right to be here. So it's not validating a self. This is important, because the self being the sense that I am somebody, there's no one to validate, actually. 
It's just understanding the emptiness of this process. But until that sense of the process is a healthy one and a clear one, that there is no being in there to be invalidated, then how can we let go of the feeling that we're invalid? Because we're identified with that invalidity. I'm an invalid. I'm no good. And that's an obstacle to the joy of life. It's just the, the joy of breathing. So we're starting out crippled. Invalid. What is an invalid? Well, it conjures up someone who's unable to walk, paraplegic. Somebody has physically inv invalid. But if we're emotionally an invalid, it's, it's much more difficult, actually. I had a, a dear friend, his name was Scott. At the age of 25, he was in a terrible car accident, and he became a paraplegic. So, no, sorry, he was a quadriplegic. Um, I only learned those words in my older age, so I mix them up. So Scott couldn't move anything, but he could smoke a cigarette if you put it in his mouth. And uh, I used to go and, and sit by his bedside and talk to him and listen to his poetry and talk to him about life and the world. He was very wise, and the people in the building where he lived, uh, there were a trail of people would come and talk to Scott and complain about life, uh, especially older people. And he would always say to them, what are you complaining about? Look at me. You know, he would try to be a mirror to them. You know, come on, wake up. Wake up to the goodness in your life. And, uh, and then there would be the nun handing him a cigarette and lighting <laughs> it for him. <laughs> you know, what would your teacher think of this? You know? uh, well, but the, the hardest part was when he would say, can you, because I don't smoke, right? Can you take it out and drop the ashes somewhere else? Because otherwise they would fall on his chest. But the being with this being who had no problem having an invalidated body, not a problem. He was in the moment a happy being, not wishing for the future, the past, or anything to be different. And we could talk about the truth, about the suffering in the world. He always asked me, why are people so miserable? Why do they all come and complain to me, anyway? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I came because I found being with him so much joy. And we could share the joy of just the Dharma being in the present. And he learned how to meditate, but he was already so awake, I didn't think that I was teaching him anything. I just thought he was teaching me, because, you know, I was not quadriplegic. I was not, I had full use of all my limbs and pr pretty attached to being free to move and walk and, and feed myself and eat and live the holy life, the life as a nun. But I felt that there was a holiness in him, a wholeness, even though his body was not whole. So there's the paradox. What are we invalidating? We are whole. We just have to touch that wholeness with the pureness of our mind. And for the mind to be pure, we have to let go of so many opinions about ourselves. It's the opinion that is the problem. It's enough to make you cry. So, I think Bhante Gunaratna called it open onion. You know, like onion, it has an eye in the middle. When you open it at the center, it makes you cry. You take out the eye and you cry. But let them be tears of joy, because waking up is a joyful experience. And it's a process. Never feel discouraged if it takes a long time. Just bring a moment of presence to the pain within you and articulate that pain as an adult because in an, as, as an adult with all your faculties 
you can train those faculties to be wise, present, trusting. Even though there's nothing you can trust, trust yourself, your own ability to be here. Now to bring up a sense of gratitude and focus on the pain until it dissolves and there isn't just noticing it, it's impermanent. It's not solid. If you study the pain in your knee for a whole hour, after a few minutes, it'll move. It won't be in one place. It'll spread. It'll grow or it'll disappear because it's impermanent. And it's suffering, right, but it's empty. So then you take out the eye, pull out the thing that holds this facade together that makes the world and your whole life into a circus when actually it's just a balancing act. We can all do it. We just have to have the courage to try and keep trying. It does work. The Buddha guarantees it. <laughs> he didn't teach it because it was impossible. He taught it because it's possible. My last question. Last question. Well, I think you've been covering it. Um, the self and the fitness seems so intertwined. And I was uh, unsure if um, one can get beyond fear without getting beyond the self. There are simply all the defilements mm -hmm. ahead of the self. Yes. Everything we are. That's right. We just take it apart. Huh? Is it fit by bit? Is there a way to lose the self bit by bit? Or does it just go by losing? And working on the defilements. Work, abandon what is defiled, tainted, stained, untrue, abandon it fast. And it's different for everyone, isn't it? It happens at a different pace and a different way for each of us. For some people, it happens more easily. For some, there's a heavier burden to bear. And we just accept what our burden is and put it down as much as we can, mm. as gracefully, as graciously, as lovingly as we can, as fearlessly. Thank you for your attention.